The human heart is supposed to be clearly divided between two sides. The right one pumps the deoxygenated venous blood coming from the body towards the lung, whereas the left deals with the oxygenated arterial blood and sends it through the aorta to the systemic circulation. Atrial septal defects, ventricular septal defects, and patent ductus arteriosus are abnormal communications between systemic and pulmonary circulations and allow blood to flow from one side of the heart to the other. This is essentially what a shunt means. It's a vascular shortcut, an atypical link between two chambers or vessels from the circulatory system that allows blood to take an unusual and often undesirable path. But, of course, unless it's a surgical shunt, then it would be artificial, but intended and totally desirable. Or if it's a fetal shunt, ductus arteriosus is normal in fetal life, but it should not remain open, patent, after birth. The reason we call ASG, VSG, and PGA left to right shunts is because the pressure in the chambers and vessels of the left heart is higher than the one in those of the right heart, causing blood, at least initially, to flow from the left to the right. Flow naturally occurs from the highest pressure chamber to the lowest one. This could mean from the left atrium to the right atrium, from the left ventricle to the right ventricle, or from the aorta to the pulmonary trunk. And since it's arterial oxygenated blood flowing from the left chambers to the right chambers, where it will mix with venous deoxygenated blood and not the other way around, the blood being pumped into the aorta will remain fully oxygenated and will not observe cyanosis. That is why G's, that are some of the most common cardiac abnormalities found overall, including in neonates, are considered acyanotic congenital heart diseases. That will be the case at least until Eisenmenger syndrome, one of the late complications, develops. In a patient with a left-right shunt, the right chambers of the heart will, eventually long-term, hypertrophy and try to strengthen to cope with the chronically increased pressure particularly the right ventricle. In a normal heart, the left ventricular pressure is three to four times higher than the right ventricular pressure. The presence of a ventricular septal defect communicating both ventricles, however, will tend to equalize pressure between them. A large hole will allow pressure difference to be completely eliminated, thus being called non-restrictive. Small defects will restrict the amount of blood that can be transferred between chambers, preventing pressure difference from disappearing. They are, for this reason, called restrictive VSGs. Remember that, since much larger volumes are being pushed into the pulmonary circulation, pulmonary artery pressure will be much higher than normal, and the right ventricle will have to put an extra effort into pumping the blood into the pulmonary trunk. Eventually, after many years of working with a heavy load, the right ventricle, much like someone that goes to the gym, will become stronger and may surpass the left ventricle pressure. Since the pressure is now higher on the right side of the heart, blood flow will reverse and it will start flowing from the right to the left. Now, it's deoxygenated venous blood that's being drawn together with arterial blood in the left heart, and the blood being pumped into the systemic circulation will start being partially oxygenated. Thus, cyanosis may arise in a child or teenager that had never manifested it once the right ventricle overcomes 
the left heart pressure. This pathophysiological development leading to late cyanosis is known as Eisenmenger syndrome. Still, even if the right ventricle can eventually overcome the left one, that does not mean it's comfortable with this situation. We've stated that the part of the arterial blood arriving at the left heart is constantly being shunted to the right vessels and chambers. Therefore, the pressure in the right side of the heart will be continuously higher than normal. Well, this will lead long-term to straining of the right heart chambers, which are not used to dealing with such a high pressure and may cause right heart failure, another possible complication. Similarly, in the case of patent ductus arteriosus, if the blood being pumped into the aorta is being partially recirculated into the left heart, left chambers will be volume overloaded and left atrial and ventricular enlargement may be noted. Thirdly, the extended expose of the lung vasculature to elevated pressure may cause pulmonary vascular disease and lead eventually to primary pulmonary hypertension. And finally, regarding atrial septal defects, there is also the lifelong risk of paradoxical embolism. That is, the risk that an embolus generated from a venous thrombus, usually in the lower extremities, may traverse the defect. This way, rather than impacting on the lungs and causing pulmonary embolism, it may reach the systemic circulation through the left heart from where it could cause a cerebrovascular occlusion, for example. As is typical with congenital heart defects, the etiology is often poorly understood and or varies between mechanisms. Atrial septal defects and ventricular septal defects may arise from multiple different mechanisms that ultimately result in some kind of hole between both sides of the heart. ASGs, for example, may be osteum primum ASGs caused by incomplete fusion of the septum primum with the endocardial cushion, osteum secundum ASGs caused by excessive resorption of the septum primum, sinus venosus ASGs caused by abnormal fusion of the embryological sinus venosus, and coronary sinus ASGs caused by the absence of a roof in the coronary sinus. This classification deserves a video of its own, and we won't delve into deeper details here. Overall, atrial septal defects are associated with a multitude of gene defects that control cardiomyocytes growth and differentiation during atrial septum formation. Consequently, it's associated with multiple syndromes, such as holt oran syndrome, Ellis van Creveld syndrome, and familial ASG syndrome. Would you like to hear an extensive list of all the genes associated with ASG? Yeah, yeah, I thought so. Just remember, ASG is twice as common in women than in men. Its incidence is 1 to 2 per thousand live births. Ventricular septal defects can be membranous or perimembranous or muscular, depending on which part of the interventricular septum has been affected. There are also the subpulmonary, also known as cono or supracrystal, and endocardial cushion defect, aka posterior. There is even a fifth type, the malalignment VSG, when the ventricular septal defect is involved in tetralogy of follow, for example, rather than isolated. This classification is complex and there are many redundant terms. We are not going to cover it in this video. The incidence of isolated VSGs, that is, ventricular septal defects that are not part of complex cardiac anomalies, such as tetralogy of Fallot, is 2 to 6 per thousand live births. The single fact I said per thousand live births rather than per hundred thousand live births shows we're talking about an extremely common condition 
in the context of pediatric cardiology. VSGs are extremely common for congenital malformations. VSG inheritance is multifactorial, meaning influenced by genetics but not determined by them, and it's very prevalent in Patau, Edwards and Down trisomies, 22Q11 deletion syndromes, and also in some other less famous deletions. It is slightly more common in females. Patent ductus arteriosus is a common condition with many different possible origins. It has some familial causes associated with chromosome 12. It may be present in many chromosomal abnormalities, and it can also result from congenital rubella infection in the fourth trimester of pregnancy. Hypoxia, fetal alcohol syndrome, and maternal consumption of amphetamines and phenytoin, prematurity, and low birth weight are important risk factors. PGA incidence is approximately 0.5 per thousand live births, but this value is debatable. Like with other shunts, it's twice as common in females in the absence of teratogens. The smaller the defect, the higher the chance it will be asymptomatic. Still, since the presence of a murmur is widespread, it may very well lead to an investigation that reveals the abnormality. ASGs display S1 splitting due to delayed closure of the tricuspid valve. VSGs present with a harsh holosystolic murmur loudest along the left sternal border, blood flowing through the defect as the left ventricle contracts. NPGAs are well known for their characteristic continuous machine-like murmur. Because of the paucity of symptoms, ASGs are often diagnosed only in adulthood. They may then present with arrhythmias or symptoms of heart failure, such as exertional dyspnea and fatigue, aka tiredness and shortness of breath. A paradoxical embolism event may also be the initial finding that elicits cardiac investigation albeit not as commonly. Small VSGs are also usually detected only by auscultation of a murmur in contrast with larger VSGs that may cause early congestive heart failure and present as poor wife K, tachypnea and tachycardia in an infant. PGAs are often asymptomatic in children where it sometimes manifests as failure to thrive. Congestive heart failure typically is a late presentation, seen only in adults. In some, but not all, of the ASG, VSG, and PGA patients, cyanosis can also be a late presentation owing to the development of Eisenmenger syndrome. Chest radiography will often display cardiomegaly if the shunt is large, as well as pulmonary vascular markings from increased pulmonary flow. In atrial and ventricular septal defects, the cardiomegaly is derived from dilation of the right atrium and ventricle, whereas in PGA, it is mostly due to left atrium and ventricles enlargement. Yet, gold standard for diagnosis, as with pretty much all congenital heart diseases, is Doppler echocardiography. Once again, as is the rule in congenital cardiac defects, Catheterization for diagnostic purposes is usually reserved for more complex cases where other variants have been considered, such as significant pulmonary hypertension. The ductus arteriosus, as mentioned, usually closes spontaneously when exposed to higher partial oxygen pressures and deprived of prostaglandin E2. Since here we want to hasten its closure, preventing the production of prostaglandins by inhibiting the cyclooxygenase-mediated metabolism of arachidonic acid should cause it to close on its own. You may remember that this is the mechanism of action of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So, indomethacin or intravenous ibuprofen are routinely administered to these patients. Should the ductus arteriosus maintain its patency 
this five indomethacin, a percutaneous procedure may be indicated to obstruct the connection by placing a coil in it, or alternatively, surgical ligation. Beware that in some specific cases, such as transposition of the great arteries, where greater and more severe cardiac malformations are present, the patent ductus arteriosus may be beneficial or even necessary to maintain life. This is the exception overall, but it is important to check if there are other heart abnormalities associated with PGA and evaluate whether in this specific condition the PGA is providing a benefit or a loss before closing it. Small atrial septal defects may close on their own during childhood and not require intervention. Should that not be the case, or should the defect be large, cardiac catheterization or surgery will likely be necessary for placement of a patch, synthetic or pericardium, in the hole between both atria, seeking to occlude it. There is some debate regarding whether it's necessary to close small atrial septal defects in an adult due to the risk of paradoxical embolism over the entire life versus the procedure risks. Low-risk percutaneous procedure tend to lower the threshold for recommending surgery. Small ventricular septal defects may forego surgery because, like atrial septal defects, they may close spontaneously in the first two years of life. Larger VSDs should at least take consideration of the criteria for surgeries. VSG closure surgery, for example, should not be performed in patients that already display Eisenmenger syndrome. In other cases, typical medication for congestive heart failure may be necessary until surgery is performed. The defect closure can be achieved either with a patch or with a transcatheter device depending on the nature and location of the defect. As often is with surgeries, transplantation is the last resort. Except these ones, we are talking mostly about lung transplantation, because while the left to right shunt tend not to be overly complex to correct, the damage to the lung vasculature from the prolonged exposure to high pressures is irreversible. By the time primary pulmonary hypertension sets, correction of the heart defect is typically no longer indicated unless accompanied by lung transplantation. Thank you for watching this video and for choosing to spend your time with me. Please bear in mind that this is not meant as medical advice, only as a review. If you believe you or someone you know may have ASG, VSG or PJ, please seek your physician. If you believe one of your patients may have a left-right shun, please check the latest protocols. I hope this has been useful, and if you are interested in congenital heart disease, make sure to check my playlist on these defects, as well as my videos on other medical conditions. Thank you once more for your attention, and I hope to see you on the next video.